The 2022 live action remake of Pinocchio is not good. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say it's actually, it's, it's actually pretty bad. I know that may be a bit of a hot take for some people out there, but you know, somebody has to speak the truth. Back in 1940, Walt Disney released a pretty solid kids movie that taught good morals and lessons, and 82 years later, the shell of the Disney Corporation squeezed this turd from its creatively constipated anus. This movie represents a lot of what's wrong with modern corporate movie making. We bring in a talented director, in this case Robert Zemeckis, legendary director of such classics as Back to the Future, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Contact, Forrest Gump, and Castaway. Then you get talented cast members like Tom Hanks, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Keegan-Michael Key, Cynthia Erivo, and Lorraine Bracho. Then you throw them in a blender, squeeze out a soulless corporate and overall needless remake of an existing IP because you can't think of anything original to use. And et voila, you get movies like this. So let's, let's just get to it. Alright, so we start on the Disney logo. Man, I remember when this company made good movies. Wait, what, what is that? What's going on here? Oh, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Ah, ah, it's hideous. It looks like a grape that did the scene from American Psycho, but got interrupted halfway through and was placed upside down on a tailored suit. It looks horrendous. After Jiminy Jump scares us, he goes on to introduce us to the sludge. It's a story that begins a long time ago. Well, actually, it's a story that begins once upon a time, a long time ago. That's right, much better, much more precise. I don't even know what this means. Was that supposed to be a joke? Was this supposed to add personality to Jiminy? And now they're arguing about the meaning of Once Upon a Time. I'm the narrator telling this story post facto. Great, we're, we're getting meta commentary in our fantasy Disney movie. What is the point of this interaction between the Jiminy's? This adds nothing to the story. It just wastes time and is annoying. Anyway, Jiminy stumbles upon Geppetto's workshop and lets himself in. This is a small irk I have with this scene beat, but you know what, I, I gotta say it. In the 1940 version, Jiminy checks the window before going in. As a vagabond, Jiminy is checking to make sure that there is nobody in that immediate room so he doesn't get kicked back out to the streets for the night. Since it seems like nobody is home, this prompts Jiminy to enter Geppetto's shop. This also serves as a natural introduction to Geppetto's shop as a setting and the titular puppet. In the remake, Jiminy just throws caution into the wind and enters. See, see, that's why you check the window before breaking into someone's house. Well, I guess it still serves to introduce us to Geppetto's workshop, the clock wall, and Pinocchio himself. Is, is Geppetto singing right now? There was so much laughter. But we couldn't see. Yeah, so this movie decided to incorporate a bunch of new songs into the runtime for reasons, I guess. Most of these songs are gonna range from atrocious to barely notable. To be honest, Geppetto's song at the beginning isn't awful. It establishes that he once had a son in the past, and Pinocchio is meant to be a sort of replacement for the late boy. This isn't a bad idea, but it's just too bad that this doesn't play into literally anything else in the rest of the movie. You know what does this plot point much better? I, I don't know, I couldn't tell you. Hey look, they did the butt joke from the first movie. Well, Geppetto finishes making Pinocchio, so now we're gonna- Oh, what is this then? So it seems like some random guy wants to buy one of Geppetto's clocks and is just swinging by in the middle of the night. As you do. Senora, I'm very sorry, but I cannot sell you any of my Google clocks. Then why do you operate a shop in which you sell clocks? But if you cannot sell your clocks, why do you have a shop? That's what I'm saying! <laughs> By the way, this is the only explanation they give for Geppetto not selling clocks. It's complicated. I, I mean, not really. It'd be one thing if this guy was going to treat the clocks poorly and you didn't want to sell it to an unworthy customer. However, what Geppetto is doing is like if you pull up to McDonald's to get a Big Mac and they're just like, Oh, oh no, we, we don't sell Big Macs. But... But you're McDonald's. That, that's your thing. Yeah, well, you know, it's complicated. We just... We don't do Big Macs anymore. I mean, we have them. We just, we just don't sell them. Uh, all right, then. Uh, can I get, like, a, a double quarter pounder? So we don't sell that anymore, either. What was this interaction? What was the point of this? I mean, I guess we're establishing that Geppetto really cares about his clocks more than anything else in the world. 
Apparently, he made them all for his late wife, who... Jiminy, do, do you mind? You're, you're, you're in the shot right now. Could you just, like, step to your left? Just a couple steps real quick. So I guess this plot beat is important, but it just feels awkwardly crammed into the scene and just kind of makes no sense. I mean, even Jiminy's befuddled. Anyway, Geppetto finally names his puppet. Pinocchio. Pine. Pinocchio, Pinocchio, huh? And then we get the little dance sequence from the first movie, except without the the good, catchy music. They replace it with what sounds like, I don't know, Italian elevator music? <laughs> like, come on, no way it sounds better than this. If you wouldn't have to go play your part, bring a little joy to every heart. Hey guys, editing Spidgy here. While listening to these two songs back to back, I realized that the lyrics that 1940 Geppetto sings indicates the reason he created Pinocchio, to spread joy and laughter to those around him. Pinocchio was born out of his desire to spread love to his community, which is distinctly different from 2022 Geppetto's motivations. Just an interesting note, I guess, to kind of further delineate the differences between these two movies. Uh, anyway, Back to the video. Figaro, who apparently can tell time now, alerts Geppetto to the fact that it's almost bedtime. Then we get bombarded with a barrage of member berries. Ugh, why? This just speaks to the mindset of the Disney company. Story? Characters? New and unique ideas? Nah. Dangling surface level references to other things of higher quality that you're unable to meet? Aw oh, yeah. Much like the original movie, Geppetto spots the wishing star as he gets ready to go to bed. He wishes upon it for Pinocchio to become a real boy. Do you want to know what I wished for? I wished... no, no. At least he learned something from the original. I wished that my little Pinocchio might be a real boy. Oh, and there's the drunk clock from, from the movie. Honestly, I'm surprised they were allowed to include him. Anyway, let's continue the story. So the blue fairy descends from the heavens to fulfill Geppetto's wit. What the hell is this? What is happening? So, so let me get this straight. The wishing star just sky beams Pinocchio to life. What? What? Isn't the blue fairy supposed to be here to help set Pinocchio on his way? Where's the blue fairy? Why, why the sky beam? Oh, there she is. So after some random comedy bits, we go through the same beats from the original movie, except the Blue Fairy doesn't seem to know anything about this situation. Well, if Geppetto wanted a real boy, why would he carve a puppet? You're not really real, are you? I except she does? You're real all right. A real life living puppet that's painted to look like a real life living boy. Almost what your father wished for. This is the only scene the Blue Fairy is in, and she is so inconsistently characterized. In the original, the Blue Fairy is depicted as some sort of divine figure who watches over Pinocchio and helps him on his way. Her design is reminiscent of that current year depiction of angels, suggesting her to be this perfectly good and omniscient figure. This Blue Fairy seems to be an absent-minded schizo who tells Pinocchio to be a real boy and pisses off for the rest of the movie. Almost like she serves no purpose to the narrative. The sky beam brings Pinocchio to life, Pinocchio is able to free himself from Stromboli, and some random seagull tells Pinocchio about Geppetto being swallowed by Monstro. The blue fairy has now been rendered needlessly pointless to the script. Why? Eh, no reason. Well, at least the writer generously allows the blue fairy to keep the part where she appoints Jiminy as conscience. Would you like to be his conscience? Me? No thanks, I've uh got enough on my plate. Excuse me? Jiminy says no. I mean, he eventually is convinced to be Pinocchio's conscience. Uh, temporary conscience. Sorry, temporary conscience. In the original, Jiminy readily accepts the responsibility of being Pinocchio's conscience. I mean, sure, it's partially because a hot woman was asking him to do it, but there's still no hesitation from him to lead the next generation. In the remake, Pinocchio is basically getting some random homeless guy who can't wait to be done with him. Are you kidding me? Heaven forbid a man swoon over an attractive woman. Let's make Jiminy a conscience who doesn't give a crap about Pinocchio. Sure, that makes sense. Well, you know what, at, at the very, very least we get the very important line from the original movie. When a boy is brave, truthful, and unselfish, it makes his father proud. Wait, no, that doesn't sound right. Prove yourself brave, truthful, and unselfish, and someday you will be a real boy. Ah, there we go. 
This is the entire point of this story, not to mention the mission Pinocchio sets out to achieve, and they just randomly changed it. In the original, the Blue Fairy tasked Pinocchio to be a good boy so that he can become a real one. Boom, inciting incident. That is what Pinocchio's journey is for the story. In the remake, the Blue Fairy is just like, yeah, your dad will be happy if you're a good kid, but honestly, that doesn't matter. It's what you believe in your heart or whatever that makes you real or not. Okay, so then that negates the rest of this movie, right? If Pinocchio believes he's real, then mission accomplished, he's a real boy. There's no need for personal growth, making mistakes, or earning a transformation. He's already there. So no need for the rest of the movie. Hi, Editing Spidgy here again. I was going back through the scene and realized that I needed to be fair and at least say that the Blue Fairy does repeat the quote from the original movie. But that only really confuses the messaging in this scene by presenting two contradictory statements. So I think my point still stands, I just wanted to add that little correction. Back to recording, Spidgy. And, and now the Blue Fairy is plagiarizing Jiminy's song? Oh, okay, so now you can find her attractive. I got it. So why'd we get rid of this? But seriously, I, I, I kind of hate this moment. Once again in the original, the last thing the Blue Fairy tells Pinocchio before she leaves is... Be a good boy, and always let your conscience be your guide. This is important because it reinforces what Pinocchio needs to focus on as he goes out into the world. He needs to make sure he does good, and Jiminy is there to guide him to do the right thing. Here, the Blue Fairy just sings the famous song from the original and pisses off never to be seen again. In my video about the original movie, which you should totally check out by the way, I talked about how I originally took issue with the song When You Wish Upon a Star as it seemed to send the message that if you want something you should have it. However, the way the story plays out changes the meaning of the song when it comes back at the end of the movie to one of having to work for your dreams. The fact that this song just randomly shows up right after the Blue Fairy tells Pinocchio that if he believes in his heart he's a real boy then he'll be one reinforces what I was worried about. The Blue Fairy singing this song as she flies out communicates that if you want something or believe something then it'll happen to you or it, it's just true. This is the exact opposite message that the original movie and the original book communicated. We're barely 20 minutes into this movie and it has completely crapped all over the original message of the story. Great. I love it. Geppetto is woken up by the window latch gently falling over. I, get, I mean, I guess that's funny, I suppose. We go through the motions once again of Geppetto finding out that Pinocchio is alive. <laughs> Also on a side note, these clocks are way too complicated to be cuckoo clocks. I mean, by the time they finish their little thing that they do, it's, it's gonna be the next hour already. We get a montage of Pinocchio hanging out with his new family over the next couple of days until Geppetto decides it's time for him to go to school. Hey, you know what, at least it's been a few days so that Geppetto can take the time to make sure Pinocchio is properly registered for school so that he can naturally integrate into- What? That's not what happens? Oh, okay, in that case, piss off, movie. The reason Geppetto immediately sends Pinocchio off to school the very next morning after he came to life is because he values education for his son. This is to stress the importance of education for little boys. It's so important that Geppetto wants to send his son to school as soon as possible, not even thinking about the natural way to do it. And this Geppetto's like, We did everything I could think of, so I, gu I guess it's time for you to go to school now. I don't I have no idea what that voice was, oh my gosh. I'll still stand by my mild criticism that Geppetto should have taken steps to properly integrate Pinocchio into his school, but the 1940 version does this much better than the remake which treats school so nonchalantly. The next morning, Pinocchio gets ready to leave for school. Geppetto introduces Pinocchio to his teacher as she leads a group of students by his workshop. Look, this movie takes place in 19th century Italy. All I'm saying is, if, if, if she was present here, she definitely would not be a teacher. <laughs> Just like the original, Geppetto gives Pinocchio a book and an apple to take to school. He says a final goodbye to his son before Pinocchio leaves. And on his way there, wait, why, why are we still on Geppetto? He's, he's talking to a seagull who he apparently knows by name. Buongiorno, Sofia! And she can talk. Oh boy. Oh no. 
anyway, after that weird moment, then we cut to Pinocchio going to school. Oh, nope, we're still here. All right. Jiminy wakes up and realizes he slept in late. He bumps into the seagull outside and convinces her to take him to Pinocchio. So I guess that's why she's in the movie. Don't know why they couldn't do what they did in the original, but you know what? Oh well. Finally, we cut over to Honest John and Gideon. This generally plays out the same way as the 1940 version. John reminisces about passing Gideon off as a puppet and sees Pinocchio. They follow him, wanting to kidnap him and sell him to Stromboli. Except this time Pinocchio decides to stop and take a gander at the latest offerings from Disney. Yes, I can definitely smell shite. John and Gideon intercept Pinocchio and do the scene where they convince the puppet boy to pursue being famous. This go around, however, John is just needlessly cruel to Gideon. In the original, John keeps smacking Gideon away from Pinocchio because he keeps threatening to ruin the con. Gideon keeps misreading the situation and takes actions that are contradictory to what Honest John wants. In this, John just randomly kicks Gideon around for no reason, smacks him in the face with a school book, needlessly assaults him with a cane, denying him a snack, and jabbing him in the rib cage. Maybe it's just that the animated version feels more lighthearted with its treatment of Gideon thanks to extremely expressive animation and goofy sound effects. The limitation of trying to make these two look like realistic animals means you can't really lean into that, so this just comes across as animal abuse against a weird looking cat. And not just an actor, an entrepreneur, nay, an influencer! Oh no, you don't want to do that, Pinocchio. You, you don't want to become like these guys. Pinocchio eventually agrees to become an actor because he thinks his father would be proud of him. An actor's life is gay. You know what, I'm kind of surprised they kept this line stay in the movie, but I guess somebody has to warn him before he commits. Sophia the Seagull airdrops Jiminy onto John. Jiminy tries to get Pinocchio's attention, but also gets Gideon's. Gideon tries to smash the cricket with a hammer, but ends up giving his friend John a concussion. Because this isn't a cartoon where that's just a temporary setback, John is down for the count. Jiminy lands on Gideon's head, so Gideon tries the same strategy. It, it doesn't work out well for him either. Now, it looks like Pinocchio just committed a double homicide. He excitedly tells Jiminy he's going to become famous to make Geppetto proud. Remember what I said about temptation? Pinocchio, as a rule of thumb, when somebody calls themselves honest, they ain't. Well, that's a new lesson they decided to introduce into the story. I mean, it's a little too simplistic since kids need to trust somebody and those people are definitely going to call themselves honest. But you said if somebody says they're honest, they aren't. Who am I supposed to believe? Well, that's a good question, Pinocchio. Who can you trust? I'd trust the guy the blue fairy assigned to the case. That's right, kids. You can only trust the guy with the authority of the blue fairy. You know, you could have said, Now, Pinocchio, I'm your conscience. You can always trust your conscience. That at least would make sense as a lesson, and it would actually be in line with the original movie somewhat. Jiminy Cricket? Temporary conscience? Don't remind me you don't want to be here, Jiminy. I don't either. Oh, and then he encourages animal abuse. Hey, Pinocchio. Oh. Drop the mallet. Whoa, hold on. What's going on here? Pinocchio's actually going to school in this movie? He's actually doing the right thing? This movie can't be over already, could it? Boy, they ought to do something about all the loose gravel on this road. One of these days, a heavy wagon wheel's gonna fling one of these rocks and hurt somebody. Jiminy sends Pinocchio into school by himself. Jiminy, dude, you're, you're his conscience. I'm pretty sure you're legally obligated to accompany him everywhere. I mean, what happens when some kid offers Pinocchio some kush? Or, or if Pinocchio is tempted to cheat on tests, or if he becomes friends with some bad kids? You won't be there to guide him. You're just gonna be sitting outside of school letting him make all these poor decisions. Just gonna leave him high and dry? Bro, piss off, prune face. I get you don't want to be his conscience, but commit to the bit, bro. So Pinocchio goes into school by himself, and Jiminy gives the closing speech to end the movie. Oh, wait, hold on, what's what's going on here? Get out and stay out! School is for real children, not the ridiculous puppets. Puppies belong in the puppet show. Oh. Oh, no. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Oh my gosh, this is such an atrocious narrative decision. This is probably the most controversial decision the movie makes. 
when this movie came out, this is what everybody harped on, and rightfully so, because the whole point of the story of Pinocchio is that he never does the right thing and is punished for it in order to learn lessons. This just took all agency and blame from Pinocchio. He did the right thing. He obeyed his father and his conscience and went to school. And what happened? He was punished for it. He did the right thing and was punished. That completely takes away the point of the whole story. I can't even blame Pinocchio for going with John and Gideon to the puppet show now. Speaking of which, John traps Jiminy in a jar and swoops in to win Pinocchio back to his side. Once again, I don't blame Pinocchio for going with them. Everything John says here is 100% correct. This is no longer a con, it's just facts. But my father... Wanted you to go to school, and you did. You went to school. And what did the wise and learned schoolmaster say? Puppies belong in the puppet show. And what did you say, Jiminy? Do whatever the teacher tells you to do. So Pinocchio's still being a good boy right here. Also, where did this broad go? Isn't she a teacher at this school? She clearly knows Geppetto, and she saw him with a walking, talking puppet. Geppetto! Couldn't she have helped the poor kid out? Or did she just kidnap these kids and now they're in some undisclosed location never to be seen or heard from again? That night, Pinocchio doesn't come home, so Geppetto goes out to look for him. Unfortunately, it doesn't occur to him that Pinocchio is in showbiz now. While Stromboli introduces the puppet, Pinocchio meets two new characters backstage. Sabina is a ballerina puppet who they try to set up as a, a love interest for Pinocchio, I think? I mean, she doesn't really get a personality, and to be honest, it took me about 20 minutes to realize that she may be sentient. Her puppeteer is a crippled girl named Fabiana, who wanted to be a ballerina when she was younger, but will never be able to thanks to her leg. I'ma be frank, I don't like their inclusion in this movie. Fabiana isn't a terrible character, but her existence kind of ruins the point of Stromboli's section in the movie being how awful a life of fame and fortune really is. It's exploitative and breeds greed and corruption. In this movie, Fabiana and Sabina represent that this lifestyle isn't so bad, so Pinocchio's lesson isn't ultimately learned because his life with Stromboli isn't all that bad. It's just Stromboli who's kind of a dick. So once again, this movie spits in the face of the original. We do the big Got No Strings performance, and it's fine. It's similar enough to the 1940 classic. Except they took away the boobs from the Latina puppets! They're all flat-chested now. Oh, and Sabina gets a whole bit to herself because why not? Stromboli clumsily breaks the music machine, which causes the music to speed up. See, this is what happens when you don't invest in an orchestra. Pinocchio's dancing speeds up and ends up catching himself on fire, causing Stromboli to have to put the fire out with water. Despite literally crashing and burning, Pinocchio's performance is a hit. So, like the original movie, Stromboli counts the immense amount of cash from that night's performance. Or we cut to the puppet car from the Polar Express. Can't help ripping yourself off there, Zemeckis. Pinocchio overhears Fabiana singing to herself and decides to become a peeping Tom. I'm not gonna lie, this song's actually pretty catchy. However, it is completely out of place in this movie. First, this is a song for two completely pointless tertiary characters that are here to pad out the runtime. Second, the Latin flair feels a little weird in this whimsical fairy tale that takes place in Italy. It would fit well in something like Encanto, but here it sticks out like a sore thumb. Stromboli interrupts the performance and randomly throws Pinocchio in a cage. Why, though? In the original, Stromboli cages Pinocchio specifically because the kid expresses a desire to leave and return to his father. This is only a necessity to keep his cash cow from leaving. Here, he just randomly does it because he's an asshole, I guess? He lets the girl who clearly despises him get an entire wagon to herself, but Pinocchio can't? Why? He actually likes being here and wants to continue to be here, so doing this is completely pointless. If anything, you're just needlessly turning him against you, which you do. Mr. Stromboli said I could go home and tell my father I got famous. We cut over to Geppetto looking for his son. I don't know why he didn't just leave Figaro and Cleo at home. He fully expected to find Pinocchio that night, right? I mean, he left them at home in the original. The reason he brings them on the boat is because a boating journey is usually going to take a few days. Since we don't ever see him interact with his community, we can assume that Geppetto may not have any close friends to leave his pets with. That all is to say, this is such a weird choice, and it 
kind of looks goofy. That cannot be healthy for Cleo for you to be manhandling her fishbowl like that. Have you seen Finding Nemo? Back in Stromboli's carriage, Fabiana shows up to help Pinocchio. Unfortunately, Pinocchio doesn't trust people anymore, so Sabina is brought in to talk to him. She tells him that the key hanging on the wall is, well, the key to Pinocchio's escape. Why did Stromboli just leave it there? Why didn't he take it with him? Sabina also says that at their next stop, all of the puppeteers and puppets are going to lead a coup against Stromboli. Why haven't you done that yet? This puppet show has been going on for a while, so why are you waiting until the next stop to overthrow him? Why not do it now in order to free Pinocchio? You're just going to let that kid rot in a cage for a couple extra bucks? You know what? I'm starting to think you're a bad person. Stromboli interrupts and closes the skylight to make sure no one tries to help free Pinocchio. You know what is a good way to ensure that no one easily helps Pinocchio escape? Not leaving the key to the cage in the same room as the prisoner. <sighs> anyway, Stromboli's wagon passes the trapped Jiminy. Hey, look at that, a setup and a payoff. Even though the setup was the most awkward bit of dialogue ever, and this wouldn't have been necessary if Pinocchio had just gone straight to Stromboli's puppet show, but you know, hey, setup and payoff, they're screenwriting stuff. Look at them, guys! They're trying! I hate this movie. <laughs> Jiminy frees himself and sneaks into Stromboli's wagon. Pinocchio starts lying to Jiminy, causing his nose to grow. I didn't want to be famous! I wanted to go to school! Hey! Wait, hold up. That's not a lie, though. He did really want to go to school. Actually, he did go to school. The only reason he pursued fame was because he got kicked out and was told to pursue fame by his teacher, who you told him to listen to. Pinocchio then proceeds to lie more in order to obtain the key and earn his freedom. Hmm, hmm, I don't like that. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. The whole lesson of this scene is that lying is bad and can get out of control when you do it too much, but then Pinocchio uses his lies in order to free himself. That's a little contradictory there. What will the children think? What are they gonna learn from this? Oh, lying is bad unless you want to get out of a tight situation, then lie your ass off and you're fine. This all could have been avoided if they just did what the 1940 version did and have the Blue Fairy show up and decide to give Pinocchio one last chance to prove himself worthy of being a real boy. But because that isn't the lesson of this movie, this doesn't happen. It doesn't matter if Pinocchio lies as long as he's a real boy in his heart, as stated by Jiminy in this very scene. Remember what the Blue Fairy said? It's not about what you're made of on the outside. Being real is in your heart. That's what being real is all about. What does that even mean? If Pinocchio's actions don't reflect who he is in his heart, then that's not who he is in his heart. He is not behaving like a real boy here. In fact, he's behaving the opposite. You know what? I'm suddenly being reminded of a quote from another much better movie. It's not who I am underneath, but what I do defines me. And to be clear, I think there's room to explore the good ways to use lies. Lies can be harmful when employed to deceive and lampshade people. But when used shrewdly, lies can be used to help people and even save lives. That could be quite valuable for older children to learn. Unfortunately, this script isn't smart enough for that. No, it just says, lies are bad. Then it proceeds to use lies to get Pinocchio out of imprisonment, completely contradicting the message it was communicating. This makes for a very confusing viewing experience, especially for the kids trying to understand your lessons. Pinocchio makes his way back home to continue his work to become a real boy. Wait, what just happened? Oh, I guess we're off to Pleasure Island now. Once again, we just removed choice from Pinocchio. In the 1940 classic, Pinocchio encounters Honest John and Gideon again, and they trick him into going to this island of temptation. Pinocchio makes the choice to go to this island. Sure, he's tricked, but it is still his choice. Here, he's just straight up abducted. I mean, later, I guess they give him a little bit of a choice. Though I would say it's more that they just pressure him into not complaining about going to Pleasure Island. He's going regardless of what he wants to do. They just want him to shut up about it if he doesn't want to go. Pinocchio meets Lampwick, who is attempting some sort of New York accent. So what's your story, Slats? Why are you made out of wood? And the coachman who is there, I guess. They are given an original song where they try to convince Pinocchio to come to Pleasure Island, which is kind of pointless since he's already your captive. The song's not great, it just feels like padding more than something that is important for either the story or the characters. 
and the choreography is just kind of boring. Ooh, he swung around on his whip like he's Indiana Jones, and now he's hopping on donkeys. Wow! Okay, to be fair here, the lyrics of the song drive the point home that the script is trying to communicate about peer pressure. It's trying to show that Pinocchio only agrees to go to Pleasure Island because his peers pressure him into doing so. However, I must stress again that Pinocchio has been kidnapped. I highly doubt that the coachman would just let him go home to reveal his super secret child donkey trafficking ring to his father. This also doesn't work because they're going to Pleasure Island. The Island of Temptation. This is a lesson in temptation, not peer pressure. Now this could work if Pinocchio is being pressured into an activity that is actively going to harm him, but unfortunately that's not what happens as I'll bring up here in a second. Also I'm annoyed that there are girls here. And no, this isn't because I'm some sort of misogynistic incel or something. Well, not entirely that is. I remember the controversy from earlier this year about Peter Pan and Wendy where they included girls in The Lost Boys, and the reasoning for that criticism is the same as mine here. The entire point of The Adventures of Pinocchio in the 1940 version is that boys have very self-destructive tendencies that they need to work on to overcome to become good. Specifically with Pleasure Island, the temptations there are meant to appeal to the worst tendencies of young boys. They have more of a penchant for destroying things, getting into fist fights, smoking, drinking, and playing pool. I'm, I'm still never going to get over that. How do you ever expect to be a real boy? Look at yourself. Smoke, playing pool. Ow! While those types of things can be tempting for little lasses, anyone who's gone to a public school would know, they usually do a better job at controlling that and face more subtle temptations. The point is that this is specifically designed for little boys. The coachman states as much in the original movie. Give a bad boy enough rope and he'll soon make a check off of himself. But on the other side of the coin, the addition of the girls in the remake may also just be a reflection of how poorly we're raising our little girls in this modern day. Pinocchio and Lampwick hop on a boat ride that takes him on a tour of the island. They receive root beer for the coachman, who is apparently also the malt man. Alright, this is root beer, not actual beer. Heaven forbid there be underage drinking in our modern Disney movie! I guess we're not going to mention the fact that the entire point of the inclusion of underage drinking in the original movie is that it is bad for underage kids to drink. Look, I goof on the whole playing pool thing in the 1940 Pinocchio, which in retrospect was probably just played as a joke. But this right here is just utterly absurd. Everything on Pleasure Island is supposed to be bad for children to do, and root beer is not a bad thing for children to like, as long as you don't buy them from big soda companies. Like straight up, 90% of what they put in their sodas are not fit for human consumption. They're either going to give you cancer or diabetes. But I don't think that type of cultural commentary is what they had in mind when they included root beer in this movie. Although honestly, it would have been funny if the coachman was just like, Here's some A&W root beer. It's filled to the brim with seed oils and processed sugar. It may make you look like Nick Avocado, but it tastes bloody amazing. I probably would be singing the praises of this movie if that was included. Although I don't think A&W would appreciate that kind of product placement. Coca-Cola, it gives you diabetes. Anyway, Pinocchio witnesses a bunch of kids engaging in poor behavior. There's a kid running on a ferris wheel and stealing root beer. Lampwick throws his empty glass at kids from great heights. Kids are sliding down a mountain of candy while gorging themselves like they're in Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. <laughs> they engage in some gluttony, robbery, mindless destruction, rude language, and more mindless destruction, but this time specifically with clocks including one that looks weirdly like Geppetto. Oh, and Firework Wars. See, that, that last one, that reminds me of my childhood. Or this past 4th of July where my grandpa decided to light an artillery shell and sit it on the ground. That didn't end well for us. Also, while we're here, I just want to point out some really awkward editing. Lampwick picks up a brick and then it cuts to a giant stained glass window like he's going to destroy it, similar to what he did in the original movie. Instead, a random chair comes out of nowhere to destroy it, and then Lampwick just sits back down. Lampwick just stands up, grabs a brick, looks at a stained glass window, and then just sits back down. What was the point of that editing decision? Pinocchio expresses some doubts about being on Pleasure Island, but the coachman comes back to finish his song from like five minutes ago. 
So play, 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 time to play! <laughs> that was the most awkward way to end a song, holy crap. Oh, my song's over? I guess I'll just, uh, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just squat here real quick. I'm just gonna duck over and maybe they'll do something about this in post. I hope so. Meanwhile, Sophia the Seagull brings Geppetto a flyer for Pleasure Island. Honestly, I don't mind this. Well, besides Tom Hanks' awkward line delivery. A catastrophe! This actually provides a very specific reason for Geppetto to be out at sea later. In the original, there's no reason for Geppetto to just go out to sea to look for Pinocchio. Maybe he had looked literally everywhere on the mainland for him and just went out in a last ditch effort, but because he disappears for a good chunk of the movie, there's no real solid reason provided. Here, at least there's a decent reason for Geppetto to drop everything and head out to sea. He knows where Pinocchio is, so he's going to go out and save his son. Later, Pinocchio and Lampwick are playing pool on a now empty island. Jiminy, who is ditched on the mainland, finally arrives on Pleasure Island just in time to witness a couple of smoke monsters kidnapping a loose donkey. First, this kind of ruins the later reveal, and second, I get that they're trying to build on the designs of the coachman's henchmen from the original. However, I just, I just don't like it. To me, these henchmen were deliberately designed to be ambiguous. They may be shadowy demon creatures, or they could just be guys in really dark clothing. Okay, this shot just makes him look like a gorilla. But I guess that's the point, it's supposed to be hard to pinpoint what they are. They ride the line of realism and the fantastical in order to create something grounded yet scary for kids to look at. These CGI creatures are just a little goofy looking. I don't hate the idea, I like how their eyes look like headlights and fog, but it's just not fully working for me. Back in the billiards hall, Lampwick asks Pinocchio why he hasn't been participating in the debauchery the island offers. Pinocchio says it didn't feel right. It looks to me like he's still got a conscience inside of you. But he literally doesn't right now. <sighs> Okay, so here's the big problem with the Pleasure Island sequence. Pinocchio doesn't participate in anything. He doesn't like watching these kids participate in poor behavior. He feels guilty about being here. That completely goes against the point of this part of the story. Pinocchio is supposed to engage in this activity in order to be taught a lesson about temptation. He's supposed to mess up and get punished, but here he doesn't, which makes his donkey transformation completely unearned. Before that happens, however, Jiminy jumps in and calls out Pinocchio, but then he is immediately whacked into a water drain by Lampwick. Alrighty, so that was kind of pointless. Lampwick, have you ever thought about trying out golf? I feel like that would be a great outlet for everything going on here. That conveniently drops Jiminy right into the middle of the coachman's donkey smuggling ring. What's even more convenient is that one of the donkeys happens to have a firework strapped to its back and when the smoke monster takes it off and throws it, it lands right next to Jiminy. How convenient is that? Wow, how convenient is fucking that? Upstairs, Pinocchio is still being a goody two-shoes while Lampwick initiates his donkey transformation. You might want to check What do your... I look like to you? A jackass! <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Why'd they censor it? Either say jackass, which is what he literally is, or just replace the word in the script. This is stupid. <laughs> you sure are! Was that a, was that a hiccup? <laughs> You sound just like a don- I mean, not really, but if you say so. Holy crap, they butchered this. On top of the awkward sound editing, the poor CGI, and the okay enough performances, this turns one of the most horrifying scenes from most people's childhoods into one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Pinocchio starts his transformation into a donkey, even though, as I've established, this shouldn't be happening to him because he doesn't do anything bad on Pleasure Island except for drinking root beer and playing pool, which I guess the anti-pool lobby has more power than I realized. But seriously, there is no reason this should be happening to him. Jiminy comes shooting out of the drain riding the donkey firework in order to help Pinocchio escape. The coachman comes to collect Pinocchio and they make a run for it. They get cornered on a cliff so they have to make a jump for it. A wooden donkey would have been worth a bleeding fortune. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't really like how this is done because it establishes that the coachman has a very specific desire to make sure he turns Pinocchio into a donkey and sells him thanks to the strangely high value of a wooden donkey. So when Pinocchio jumps into the ocean, there's nothing stopping him from just hopping in his boat to pursue the puppet out to sea to make sure he gets his score. But instead, he just watches Pinocchio jump off the cliff, snap his finger, go gosh darn it, and then walk away. So now there's this weird plot hole now that the coachman isn't going after Pinocchio after this scene. In the original, he just wants donkey boys. He never directly interacts with Pinocchio, and he doesn't really care about him, so when Pinocchio escapes, he doesn't have any reason to engage in a pursuit. Here, the coachman, as he's just been characterized, would definitely chase after him until he catches Pinocchio, but he just doesn't. We don't want to bump into Monstro! Who's Monstro? A sea monster! Man, subtle foreshadowing really isn't this movie's thing, is it? Pinocchio returns home to find that Geppetto is gone. That's because he sailed out to sea. He sailed, sailed out, out to sea? Yeah, that's what I said. So he sold all his clocks and he bought a boat. Okay, not a bad idea to highlight how much Geppetto cares for Pinocchio through him selling items of such personal importance. But I still maintain that it's dumb that the writer does this through the clocks. First off, as I said a while back, he's a clockmaker, so he literally makes these to sell them. Second, it pisses me off that these surface-level Easter eggs are supposed to hold such strong emotional weight for Geppetto's character. This would have worked much better if it was a wedding ring or some of his late son's personal toys, which would not only have been a much more impactful sacrifice, but show that Geppetto has moved on from his grief to embrace his new son as his own person, serving as the first indication that Pinocchio is closer to becoming a real boy. But instead, it's the nostalgia clocks. Those clocks meant everything to him. Yes, we know. You don't have to keep telling us. You mean more to him than his beloved clocks? Shut up. Why are you here? Oh, but before we get to that... I hope I'm wrong, but that sure looks like Stromboli's to me! No, it's just Sabina and Fabiana shoehorning themselves into the movie yet again. Turns out they were able to overthrow Stromboli and start their own puppet show. You may be wondering what happened to Stromboli. Last night, the Carabinieri arrested Stromboli and put him in jail! Uh, what? What crime did he commit to earn this? Yeah, he's not a great person, but we don't see him commit any crimes in the movie. He's just a slimy entertainment manager. I mean, yeah, he threw Pinocchio into a cage, but sentient puppets are a pretty new thing. I'm pretty sure they don't have rights. I mean, entertainment people have done a whole lot worse than that, and they're still walking free. I mean, maybe he just got arrested for tax evasion. Much like my own personal hero. For legal reasons, that was, that, that was a joke. You may be wondering why these two randomly showed up. We, the members of the new Marionette Family Theater, have a very important proposition! Whoa, okay, Pinocchio is still a child. I think the police might have arrested the wrong person here. We would be honored if you would consider joining our show. Oh, okay, okay, that's, that's a little better. I have to stay and, and find my father. Pinocchio, something tells me the decision you made is the right one. Ugh, I hate this movie. I hate this movie. I hate it. Pinocchio already left the actor's life. He already made the decision to go get his father. This is something that has already been sorted out. This is completely pointless. This is played like this is the crux of Pinocchio's arc, that he finally rejected everything else in life to go back to his father and become a real boy. Oh, that's nice! Except for the fact he's been trying to do this for the past 20 minutes. The only reason he didn't yet is because he was kidnapped and taken to an island offshore. So why exactly are you people here? Actually, now that I think about it, how exactly are you people here? How in the world did you know that Pinocchio would be on this specific pier at this specific time? It's not like you've been searching for him for a while. We, the members of the new Marionette Family Theater, have a very important proposition! This makes it sound like you knew Pinocchio was right here and came straight here. How? You may be wondering where Jiminy was at during this interaction. I'll paddle out and see if she knows which way Geppetto went! Why haven't you done that yet? Actually, why hasn't she already told you where Geppetto went? Didn't she say something about where he went already? He needed to get to Pleasure Island to look for Pinocchio. Oh yeah, she did. So just head toward Pleasure Island and you'll find him. Sophia said Geppetto left about two hours ago, headed south. Or he headed south for some reason. <laughs> this is so stupid. 
but I guess it's effective enough to find Geppetto. Wait, he hasn't been eaten by Monstro yet. Hold on, Pinocchio, turn around. You're ahead of the script here. Okay, I guess this is what we're doing now. I wonder when Monstro's going to... Oh, there, there he is. L much like many other creative decisions in this movie, I hate this creative decision in this movie. When Pinocchio escapes Pleasure Island in the original movie, he comes home and doesn't know where Geppetto went. He learns from the Blue Fairy that Geppetto was swallowed by a sea monster because he was looking for his son. The immense weight of that loss weighs heavy on him. This was Pinocchio's fault. When he learns that Geppetto's still alive, Pinocchio takes it upon himself to rectify his mistake. This is an important mission for him. There's stakes and actual emotions happening within Pinocchio as he goes to rescue his father. Here, Geppetto's just cruising along and Pinocchio's just gonna be like, Oh hey, by the way, I'm here! Pinocchio fighting to save his father from the belly of a beast because it's his fault Geppetto was eaten? Versus, yeah, your dad went out for a cruise. You should probably let him know you're going back home. You tell me which one is more narratively compelling. No, the more proper question is... Who the fuck is Jiminy? Anyway, Monstro is here, and instead of being a giant dogfish like in the book, or a giant whale like in the 1940 version, he's a giant Luska-looking creature. Basically a sharktopus. See, I learned all about that fellow on River Monsters. Honestly, this isn't a bad idea, making Monstro the sea monster an actual sea monster. Despite that, the original monster somehow feels more intimidating and monstrous thanks to the expressive animation that enhanced his emotions and the combination of the sound design and score that made him sound like a steam engine. Credit should also go to Thurl Ravenscroft for his vocal performance behind the monstrous whale. And fun fact, he would later become the iconic voice of Tony the Tiger and the iconic singer of You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. These elements combine to make Monstro a terrifying beast. The 2022 version's menace is hyped up like this. Bro, it's Monstro! It's Monstro! Don't worry, Geppetto and Pinocchio aren't too worried about him. They easily get out by lighting a fire that makes Monstro sneeze. Who's Jiminy? Oh sure, now you ask. That cricket? Is your conscience? I sure am! Look, I hate to be like this, but I also hate this decision as well. In the original, the only other characters besides Pinocchio and the Blue Fairy who are able to see Jiminy are Lampwick and Gideon. This works for Lampwick because Jiminy is inadvertently being his conscience while lecturing Pinocchio, and for Gideon, it's played as a sort of irony since he can't speak to tell anyone about the cricket conscience. Being Pinocchio's conscience, Jiminy is supposed to exist in this sort of nebulous reality, where he can easily exist as a real cricket or just as a representation of the voice in Pinocchio's head. It's a neat aspect of the movie to think about. However, since this movie hates subtlety, Jiminy just straight up talks to Geppetto even though he's been established as someone who doesn't like talking to humans anyway. But to be fair, that criticism might be up to your personal preference. The rest of this chase plays out generally the same way. They get sneezed out, Geppetto is knocked out, so Pinocchio has to save him. Pinocchio rips off the Incredibles. Wait, hold on, what? I guess it was established earlier in the movie during the first montage that he was capable of doing something like this, but still, come on. This just looks silly. It doesn't help that Monstro is clearly faster than Pinocchio, but he doesn't really try to catch him. Like, I felt like I was watching this at times. They manage to get into the cave and Pinocchio dies helping his father. No, wait, Pinocchio's still alive. No, this time around it's Geppetto who dies. Well, that's dumb. The whole point of Pinocchio dying in the original movie is that he made the ultimate sacrifice to save his father. That sacrifice is what makes him a real boy. Because he was willing to correct his mistake, going so far as to sacrifice his very life for the sake of his father, he is granted his wish of becoming a real boy. He made a true act of love after disobeying and ignoring his father the entire movie. 
His work is done now and his goal has been reached. Here, Pinocchio survives, but Geppetto dies? Why? This means Pinocchio doesn't get to be a real boy. He failed his father. You lose! Good day, sir! Okay, actually, I lied. Come. <laughs> they did the Pikachu tier? Are you serious? You honestly did try with all your heart, and that makes you a truthful boy. No, that's not actually how it works. I'm sorry, coach. I tried with all my heart, but we still lost the game. That's okay, son. At least you were truthful. What? And you know what else that makes you? Unselfish and very brave. I went for the touchdown when I should have thrown the ball to Kenny. I cussed us the game, coach. You're a real boy, Billy. Man, I'm telling mom I gotta go to a different school. This one's weird as hell. This isn't how you reference earlier dialogue effectively at all. In his heart, Pinocchio is as real as any real boy could ever be. <sighs> oh boy, here we go. You will always be my real boy. This is why this movie ultimately fails as an adaptation. The original movie follows a puppet coming to life, naively making mistakes, getting punished for them, learning lessons, and making the ultimate sacrifice in order to achieve his dream of becoming real. It teaches kids to pursue education, obey their parents, and work hard to achieve their goals while avoiding temptation, deceit, fame and fortune, and strangers who make grand promises. In the remake, a puppet comes to life, bad things happen to him, and everybody affirms him as a real boy even though he isn't. Pinocchio doesn't achieve anything. He doesn't work toward his goals. Things just happen to him, and then he's told he's a real boy in his heart. The message of this movie is now, eh. If you believe in something, that's good enough to make it true. Lying is bad unless you want to use it to get out of difficult situations. Go to school unless you get kicked out, then it's okay to pursue fame and fortune. The life of fame is bad, but it's also kind of good. You're going to encounter temptation and peer pressure, but it doesn't matter because other people are just going to make poor decisions for you. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad we're done with this. I hate this movie. Burn this in a fire. Pinocchio 2022 is an unbridled disaster, a complete failure, a catastrophe even. It wants to be a new retelling of a classic while simultaneously taking a fat dump all over it by preaching a message that is fundamentally antithetical to the classic it so wants to honor. Is it malice or incompetence? I honestly couldn't say, probably a little bit of both if we're being honest. The cast and crew seem to hold the original in such high esteem, yet they pumped out this value brand turd emoji of a movie. Sure, it goes through the general motions of the original, but it makes way too many needless changes and additions in order to absolutely corrupt the entire point of the story. Nothing more exemplifies this than the main character. In the original movie, Pinocchio is a naive kid who continuously is led astray by the many figures he meets on his journey, causing him to make mistakes. He's a good kid, but he's impressionable. He pursues a life of fame and fortune because it sounds good. He goes to Pleasure Island as Honest John told him to. While he's there, he participates in drinking, smoking, fistfights, and mindless destruction because his friend said it'll be fun. Being bad's a lot of fun, ain't it? He puts his trust into the wrong people and commits wrongs as a result. In the remake, Pinocchio almost never does anything wrong. The only reason he initially goes along with pursuing fame and fortune is because he thinks his father would be proud of him. Then he actually obeys his father and goes to school, but he gets kicked out and told that he belongs in a puppet show. So naturally, listening to his teacher like he was told to do, he goes and joins a puppet show. The reason he goes to Pleasure Island is because he gets straight up kidnapped and then is threatened into not being a party pooper. On Pleasure Island, the only activity he participates in is drinking root beer and playing pool, something that actually isn't that bad of a thing to do. In fact, I think most parents would be ecstatic to find out that that is all their kids are doing when they go out. He looks concerned about the activities on Pleasure Island, even disgusted. He seems to already know the difference between right and wrong from the beginning, which renders his entire journey from this movie completely pointless. Frankly, he's a Gary Stu. The only reason bad things happen to him is because he basically is forced into it, not from his own choices. In the original, while Pinocchio is a well-meaning kid and he's tricked into the various situations he finds himself in, he ultimately makes decisions that show he isn't bothered by those said situations. 
Thanks to being characterized as a naive kid, he eagerly participates in this poor behavior because he's told to do so. He doesn't realize it's wrong, so he has to be taught. Here, Pinocchio either already knows that this poor behavior is bad, or the behavior is 100% justified thanks to how he's treated. So why should he be the main character? He doesn't grow, he doesn't change, he doesn't earn his transformation into a real boy, and then the movie ends with his feelings and beliefs being affirmed and it tells the audience that it doesn't even matter if he became real or not. Let's take a look at a different character who goes through a similar arc. In the first Iron Man movie, Tony Stark is introduced as a narcissistic billionaire playboy who will bang anything with tits and good curves, overindulge in drugs and alcohol, and gleefully sell WNDs in order to fund his highly self-destructive lifestyle. His life is changed when his own weapon is used against him by terrorists and he's tortured by them for months. He builds a relationship with his fellow captive, Ho Yensen, who he once treated like dirt. Despite this, Jensen helps Tony build the first Iron Man suit in order to orchestrate his escape. During said escape, Jensen sacrifices his life for Tony and with his dying breath, he tells Tony not to waste his life. This fundamentally changes Tony's worldview and he dedicates his life to using his money, company, and technology to save lives rather than end them. This all happens in the first act of Iron Man and it's such a well-told character transformation. I mean, imagine if if Tony started the movie as a good dude who doesn't want to sell weapons and is only doing so because Obadiah Stane is forcing him to. If he doesn't, Obadiah will kill him. Tony gets kidnapped by terrorists, runs away, and comes home to find out Obadiah died of cancer or something, so he's able to take over the company and cancel the production of missiles. That would take away Tony's dynamic character arc, making him a much flatter character from the start, and it would take away the betrayal of his father figure and the overall conflict with him. It would be a pointless story to tell. That's exactly how Pinocchio is in the 2022 remake. Oh, and on a side note, I don't blame Benjamin Evans Ainsworth for this. For whatever reason, people always think you're bullying the actor when you say their character is poorly written. The kid seems nice, and I'm sure it's exciting to be a part of a big Disney movie. He does a good job at portraying an excited child experiencing life for the first time, though the way they edit his dialogue together can sound really bad. You're wrong, Lampy! I still call what you did cheating! Geppetto, on the other hand, actually gets a couple of changes that aren't too bad, at least conceptually. He gets to have the honor of having a dead wife and son in the remake, giving him a more emotional reason for creating Pinocchio than just because. Pinocchio is now being made as a replacement for Geppetto's son, and the script attempts to give Geppetto a character arc where he learns to accept Pinocchio as his own person rather than just a sequel to his son. Honestly, not a bad idea. The issue is that you're adapting the 1940 Pinocchio where Geppetto is only in the beginning and the end of the story. He's supposed to be a static character who is defined by his love for his son that he would literally go to the ends of the earth to find him and bring him home. If you're going to add a tragic backstory and character arc for Geppetto, you have to involve him more in the story and actually address the fact that he made Pinocchio to replace his son instead of saying he did and moving on. In fact, there's another Pinocchio adaptation that came out in 2022 that does this much better. Father, when can I leave to be on my own? No, I'm just kidding, it's the Guillermo del Toro one. Out of everything in this movie, Geppetto has dealt the least amount of damage in the process of adaptation, though I will say it felt like Tom Hanks slept through his performance during this movie. The original Geppetto was so expressive and full of life while Tom just kind of dodders around and seems like a daft grandpa. Jiminy Cricket has gone from a humble vagabond with a good heart trying to help guide Pinocchio through the temptations of life to a reluctant conscience who is pretty much rendered pointless thanks to Pinocchio's existing knowledge of right and wrong. The 1940 Jiminy was a flawed guy with a weakness for women and maybe a bit of a sketchy past, but he tried his best to make sure Pinocchio became a real boy. He was genuinely invested in Pinocchio being on the right path. He was actually disappointed when Pinocchio went off to become an actor and even questioned his own advice when it seemed like Pinocchio had found his place in life. He's also disappointed in Pinocchio when the puppet goes to Pleasure Island and engages in harmful behavior. Each time Pinocchio makes a mistake, Jiminy is there to tell him he's wrong and leave him to the consequences of those actions before coming in to try to save him. He lets Pinocchio learn his lessons, but he's still there for him to lift him up, almost like what a good parent would do. 
Remake Jiminy doesn't even want to be Pinocchio's conscience and only agrees to do so under the condition that this will be extremely temporary. He doesn't do a lot to guide Pinocchio. I mean, he's distressed about Pinocchio becoming an actor even though the boy was just doing what he was told. Do whatever the teacher tells you to do. Puppies belong in a puppet show. He basically does nothing on Pleasure Island. The only chance he gets to impart wisdom on Pinocchio there gets ruined by a well-placed drain. He's just a guy who's there for most of the movie, either narrating to the audience or awkwardly expositing information. Or just weirdly breaking the fourth wall for no reason. At least Joseph Gordon-Levitt is entertaining with his really goofy voice. Pinocchio! Hey Pinocchio! Over here! Most of the other returning characters don't get much better of a treatment. Stromboli goes from a very expressive but exploitative talent manager to a bumbling oaf who is still a bit of a jerk, but more unnecessarily. His impact on the story and moral of Pinocchio is greatly diminished thanks to the existence of Fabiana and Sabina, who we'll get to in just a second. Honest John and Gideon are pretty much the same. Much like the other returning characters, they get reduced screen time, but their personalities, motivations, and dynamic are pretty much the same, apart from John's more needless cruelty towards his friend. The remake gets rid of their relationship with the coachman, which deprives us of some of their best moments. Oh, this makes it perfectly clear. Keegan-Michael Key does his best as Honest John, but his delivery of some of John's best lines is just not as good as Walter Catlett's. The coachman in the original was a sinister, almost demonic figure that sought to tempt boys into indulging their worst vices in order to anamorph them into donkeys and exploit them. The remake turns him into a wacky goofball who rides on shadow monsters. His plans are the same as the original, but because he acts like a wacky cartoon character, the impact and dread of Pleasure Island is greatly diminished. I guess Luke Evans looked like he was having fun in the role though. Lampwick is pretty much the same as this kid who indulges in every bad behavior he's presented with. His big donkey transformation lacks the impact it had in the original, less so because of his characterization in Lou and Lloyd's performance, and more so the coachman's poor characterization and the awful CGI and dialogue editing. A jackass! The Blue Fairy feels like such an afterthought in this. All of the big important moments she participates in from the original movie exclude her. A random sky beam brings Pinocchio to life, Pinocchio frees himself from Stromboli, and some random seagull guides Pinocchio to Geppetto. Also, she doesn't even get to change Pinocchio into a real boy because that doesn't matter anymore. So what exactly does she get to do in this movie? I mean, I guess she tells Pinocchio to be a good boy and messily tells him how to do so. And I guess she also teaches Pinocchio how to speak properly. Then she steals Jiminy's song and flies away. And I think she may have brought Geppetto back to life with Pinocchio's magic tear. It's not very clear, but that water he spit up was very sparkly. Cynthia Arrivo has a nice voice, and honestly, I think that's the only reason they kept this character in the movie. She went from Pinocchio's guide and judge to being a throwaway character that could easily be written out of the movie without impacting the plot at all. The remake also introduces a handful of new characters, most of which don't get a lot of screen time. The guy who wants to buy Geppetto's clocks is just awkwardly shoehorned into the movie for some frankly thin narrative setup. There is now a talking seagull who plays a key role in the story, I guess. But that role is only really used to circumvent plot points from the original movie. She steals one of the Blue Fairy's key moments, and she is a water taxi for Pinocchio as opposed to him walking around underwater, or swimming, as he is shown to be able to do. She's not egregiously awful or anything, but Talking Seagull feels like an unnecessary addition to the story. See, I couldn't even be bothered to remember her name. Lorraine Bracho feels wasted, and honestly, I don't think her voice really fits this role. But I guess on the bright side, this isn't the worst Disney live-action remake Seagull. Now, the new characters I take the most issue with are Fabiana and Sabina. Fabiana is a random puppeteer who aspires to own her own puppet show company. That's nice and all, but here's the thing. She fundamentally ruins the lesson of this part of the story. The whole point is that Pinocchio made a wrong decision in choosing to pursue fame and fortune. He chooses a life that will chew him up and spit him out, exploiting him and using him until he's of no use to those profiting off him. These two's existence corrodes that lesson by showing Pinocchio that 
that this life isn't too bad, and when Pinocchio escapes, he doesn't learn that this life is something he should avoid, he just gets away from a bad dude. When Fabiana and Sabina take over and come back, Pinocchio's rejection of their offer doesn't feel satisfying since Pinocchio really has no reason for doing so. He still thought that his father would be proud of him for pursuing fame, and he never learned the actual pitfalls of that lifestyle. He could realistically join the puppet show after the credits roll. Actually, I just realized that that's Pinocchio's only option. The movie basically says that it doesn't matter if Pinocchio became a real boy, but it kind of does. If he stayed a puppet, he still wouldn't be able to attend school, so his only options are staying with Geppetto forever, or joining the acting troupe. Is this movie trying to convince children to join Hollywood and thus giving the industry more kids to abuse? Holy crap, did I actually stumble onto something? Hold on, let me grab my tinfoil hat real quick. So I've already talked in length about how this remake fundamentally contradicts and destroys the message from the original, but it needs to be emphasized how badly this movie butchered the morals and messages of its predecessor. The original Pinocchio was a morality tale, meaning that its main focus was the message it conveyed to its audience. Every element of the story was meticulously pieced together to build this message up. It taught kids lessons about lying, disobeying your parents, temptation, and the consequences of pursuing your own selfish instincts. It taught kids that being good requires hard work and that your dreams and wishes are to be earned. The remake in turn rejects this in order to tell kids to just believe and you'll be fine. And look, as a Christian, I think it's fine to rely on faith and belief in any situation. The thing is, the Bible preaches taking action for your faith. What's the verse? Oh right, faith without works is dead. You put your faith into God and display your faith by taking actions he tells you to take. We do everything we can for him, and we rely on him to handle the things we can't control. Sounds a little reminiscent of the original Pinocchio. The remake is all about faith and belief without those works. On biblical principle, Pinocchio's belief that he's a real boy is dead because he does nothing to achieve it. Not only is this narratively unsatisfying, but it's just thematically empty. It's not inspirational or aspirational at all. I'm not like a big anime guy or anything, but I recently watched one that instantly hooked me. Blue Lock is about hundreds of teenagers competing to become the best striker in Japan and play for the national U20 team. Each player believes that they should be the one to take that spot, but what makes this anime compelling is that they all have to work for it, evolving their abilities and changing their mindsets about how they play. This is narratively satisfying and thematically resonant as it touches on how we as people must continuously improve ourselves to truly excel at achieving our dreams. Pinocchio 22 doesn't do that. It wants to tell a tale of being perfect just the way you are, which is fine, I guess, but it doesn't work in the context of Pinocchio. When you try to change the story to fit this message while keeping lines and story beats from the original story that completely contradict that message, it completely crumbles under the weight of incompetence. The 2022 Pinocchio remake wants to have its cake and eat it too. It is an utter failure of an adaptation and as a story. It wasn't the first Disney live action remake to fail so spectacularly spectacularly, and it certainly won't be the last. It isn't the cause of Disney's continual downward spiral in quality, it's just a symptom of the disease. Frankly, I don't blame the company for sneaking this onto Disney Plus to sweep it under the rug. I wouldn't want to know it existed either. It is an unabashed failure, an unbridled abomination. One might even call it a catastrophe! Pinocchio 2022 represents a lot of what's wrong with Disney's sludge of content, and it's a shame that a company that once turned out waves upon waves of instant classics and box office magnets is now wallowing in a sea of filth that everyone tries to sidestep on their way home from work. Much like homeless Joe who lives right outside my apartment. Sometimes they'll give us a gym, but that's few and far between. Call that company Oppenheimer because they have become death, destroyer of IPs. Thanks for watching. I mean, they didn't even make the fish hot. Come on, guys.